This is the audio described version of the short film In Search of Greek Theatre, Antigone, from the National Theatre. The film lasts just under 16 minutes and will follow immediately after this three minute introduction. It's presented by Dr. Lucy Jackson, Assistant Professor in Ancient Greek Literature at Durham University, and Erin Lee, Head of Archive at the National Theatre. Lucy is a white woman in her 30s, with short, dark brown hair and small hoop earrings. She wears a mustard yellow cardigan over a black t-shirt and black jeans. Erin is a white woman in her 30s, with long brown hair pulled back in a ponytail and glasses with black frames. She wears a black short sleeve top and cream jeans. Lucy and Erin are in a large room with archive materials set out on tables, including scale models of sets, folders of notes, and grey archive boxes containing photos and hand-painted set and costume designs. There are also costumes and masks on stands. The full-face masks have openings for eyes and mouths and are painted a single neutral colour, with long hair made of twine dyed black or bright red. In the archive reading room, a researcher sits down and puts on headphones to watch a recording. As Erin and Lucy speak, Images of documents, photographs and sketches from the archive appear in close-up, along with video from the 2012 National Theatre production of Antigone. Designed by Sutra Gilmore, this production is set in an underground bunker, with curved concrete walls that echo the shape and material of the Olivier Theatre. There's an office in the bunker, furnished with curved wooden desks and 1970s office equipment like typewriters and reel-to-reel recorders. In the centre of the room, there's a glass-walled cubicle. Jodie Whittaker plays Antigone. She's a white woman in her twenties, with wavy brown hair pulled back from her face. She wears a grey cotton shirt dress in a subdued geometric print, with white ankle socks and leather shoes. She's later shown in a wedding dress of heavy cream silk with long-fitted sleeves, and then in an oversized, shapeless dress in rough grey cotton like a prison uniform, her hands bound with plastic cable ties. Creon, played by Christopher Eccleston, who's a tall white man in his thirties, wears a white shirt and dark trousers. The poster for the production of Antigone shows a woman's hand shooting up out of the ground in a forest, like a buried person reaching up for help, or a plant growing from the soil. Lucy and Erin look through grey archive folders and carefully hand photos and drawings to each other, smiling as they read production notes and diaries. National Theatre. In search of Greek theatre. Antigone. I'm Lucy Jackson, Assistant Professor in Ancient Greek Literature. I'm Erin Lee, Head of Archive at the National Theatre. In this series of films, Erin and I will be looking at some of the Greek tragedies that have been staged at the National Theatre. Using the records held in the theatre's archive as a starting point, we'll look at the practicalities of staging an ancient Greek play in a modern theatre building. The archive is home to thousands of items, from photographs to prompt scripts, technical drawings to set models, dating all the way back to our opening night in 1963. Every production has left behind some traces of the multiple artistic choices and practical considerations that go into making a performance. By exploring these plays as staged productions rather than as pieces of literature, we begin to see these ancient works in a new light. Going behind the scenes of the productions makes us ask fresh questions about why these plays and their myths are still relevant today. One of the most famous of the Greek plays, Sophocles' Antigone, was staged at the National Theatre in 2012, directed by Polly Findlay and translated by Don Taylor. A video. Simple yes or no. Did you hear of my order forbidding the burial? Of course I heard it. How could I not? And yet you dared to disobey the law? Yes, I did. Because it's your law, not the law of God. Natural justice, which is of all times and places numinous, not material, A quality of Zeus, not of kings, recognises no such law. You are merely a man. Mortal like me and the laws you enact cannot overturn ancient moralities. A common human decency. Exploring the setting, a scale model of the circular office. 
How productions are staged and where they're set is worked out by the director in close collaboration with the designer. The designer for Antigone was Sutra Gilmore. Something that audiences may have noticed as soon as they entered the auditorium was how the set blended with the architecture and style of the Olivier Theatre and the National Theatre building itself. Early on in the rehearsal process, the full cast and crew are briefed on ideas for the production's design. In this brief, we saw how there was a clear aim to blur the boundary between the stage and auditorium, using the same carpet for both, and having the same purple colour as the audience's seats for a number of the onstage chairs. The concrete effect used for the set blended with the concrete of the Olivier walls. Audiences may not have been consciously aware of this mirroring of stage and auditorium, but the subtle elements of the design bring the audience right inside the action of the play. At the very beginning of the play, the whole cast gathers around a table and reacts to a series of events shown on a screen. Audiences were directed to compare this onstage tableau with an image of the US president in 2011, Barack Obama, and several members of the US government reacting to the military operation to assassinate Osama bin Laden. The prompt script outlines the detailed direction given to each actor in order to mirror this precise photo. While some elements of the staging were very contemporary, there were other elements that located the action of the play a little further back in history. In an interview, Polly Finley talks about wanting to create a more indeterminate setting. She says, any immediately recognisable setting makes us look at the play in close-up when we need to be able to see it in widescreen. The production files hold numerous documents and images which would have inspired the design team, but also helped the cast too. A series of shots from the film The Lives of Others, set in 1980s East Berlin, were pinned up on the rehearsal room walls. A document that gives us a list of questions for Sutra gives us a glimpse into the process of building up this evocative but non-specific setting. The kind of newspapers the cast will use on stage should be 70s, Russian or DDR, that's the German Democratic Republic but it's also specified that there be no dates on the prop newspapers. We even find some examples of these in the Props Bible. In creating this undefined setting on stage, this production of Antigone recreates how it was for an ancient Greek audience to be watching the play. Myth for the ancient Greeks existed in a kind of undefined past, a world where different time periods were blurred together. The open space of the ancient Greek theatre a model that was the inspiration for the Olivier Theatre itself also encouraged a blurring between the world of the play and the world of the audience. We can see the same balance of fluid setting and the blurring between audience and actors in this production of Antigone. Exploring the costume, a dress of heavy cream silk with long sleeves. Costume was of great importance in ancient Greek theatre and although none of these costumes have survived, the resources of the National Theatre Archive allow us to examine contemporary decisions about costume, helping us to understand a play like Sophocles' Antigone on its feet and in technicolour. In this production of Antigone, all of the costumes fit the 20th and 21st century setting, with those worn by women more obviously in line with a Cold War Central European look. The dress worn by the actor Jodie Whittaker, paired with ankle socks and lace-up shoes, highlights the youth of the character of Antigone. It's very feminine, girly even. It is not perhaps what we might expect a rebel to wear. A second version of the dress, a broken down version, was worn after Antigone has buried her brother. It may not have been visible to most of the audience, but the seams have been stressed and the front and sleeves are covered in dirt. The change in costume gives us a sense of what has happened off stage. She has had to bury her brother on her own and the dress shows how physically demanding, how hard and grubby the task has been. She's a different person now. In a number of the production stills, we see Antigone in a different dress, and the rehearsal notes refer to this as a wedding outfit. This links back to an important motif of marriage in Sophocles' play. Antigone was meant to be marrying Haman, she was meant to be looking forward to a happy future as his wife, but now that life is being cut short. Wearing a wedding dress for her execution creates a grimly ironic association between marriage and death. 
By the time the production was filmed, however, it seems like this particular costume was swapped out for the baggy cloth dress we see her in here. There aren't any indications as to why the wedding outfit didn't end up being used in the production. Did the baggy dress create more sympathy for the character of Antigone? We're left to think about why such a decision was made. A close-up on an office desk. The silver balls of Newton's cradle and executive toy clack back and forth. Creon stops the movement. Lights flicker in the office. His staff shuffle nervously. After the lights go out, Tiresias comes in, his scalp and face covered in pustules, eyes unseeing. He's led in by a boy who wears metal and leather leg braces and limps painfully. The entrance of Tiresias, a blind, truth-telling prophet, and the boy that leads him is a strange and striking moment in this production. In looking at the records held by the archive, we see how the team focused on creating a particular vision of these two characters. Early on in the rehearsals, the creative team were researching the kind of injury that might have occurred in a 20th century conflict. These wounds and injuries all had to be workshopped. They eventually decided on creating the effect of an acid burn for Tiresias. Tiresias carries the boy. The team had to go to considerable lengths to create the impression Tiresias' companion had either lost their hair or had had their head shaved. Bald caps had to be fitted to each actor. One of the children had had allergic reactions to glue in the past, and so, with the permission of his parents, ended up shaving his head for the production. Without these notes, we might never have appreciated the practical and ethical challenges involved in staging this scene. Metal and leather braces. Along with the acid burn and the shaved heads, these braces for a leg and an arm, worn by the boy, add to the impression that the people of Thebes have suffered catastrophically in the recent conflict. When Tiresias and the boy come on stage, we are confronted with the results of a horrific conflict in the outside world. Such a stark image reminds us of the recent war and gives some license to Creon in his harsh punishment of Antigone. Exploring the chorus. One of the unique features of ancient Greek drama, and something that always presents a bit of a challenge or an opportunity for modern theatre makers and theatre goers, is the chorus. In many ways, this production presents us with a very classic Greek chorus, but at the same time, does something quite modern and different with it. In ancient Greek drama, the chorus was made up of 12 to 15 male performers with a single collective identity. They would have moved, spoken, and sung in unison, at least for some of the time. In the large theater spaces of ancient Greece, it would have been very difficult to distinguish between individual members of the chorus, not least because they would have been wearing masks. In this production of Antigone, the chorus are all male, and are all working in the same space and towards the same goal, maintaining the government of Thebes in the wake of the Civil War. But in a way that is very different to ancient Greek theatre practice, each member of this chorus is an individual with their own character title, their own backstory, and they move independently in accordance with their different jobs. This was an approach to staging the chorus that the director, Polly Findlay, had already worked out ahead of rehearsals, as we can see from this email sent to the chorus. The rehearsal notes held by the archive show that the actors in the chorus took the development of their individual characters very seriously. The actor, Jason Cheater, requests some real-life electrical equipment that he, as janitor, can be tinkering with while Michael Grady Hall, as office boy, requests a water dispenser or water bottles so that he can perform one of his tasks, keeping people hydrated. One member of the chorus, Stavros Demetraki, even developed his own filing system in line with his role as archivist. In the props bible, there are some of the archivist labels too. Watching the production, it's possible we may not even notice how much is going on. Here's Stavros examining some photo negatives ready for filing, while Cobna Holbrook-Smith performs one of his choral odes. In a way, the archive reveals aspects that we might not have realised just watching the production. We can see all this extremely realistic detail and action, with each member of the chorus developing their own office space and their own internal world. There's a phrase coined by the philosopher Hannah Arendt, the banality of evil. 
that just keeping your head down and doing your job without thinking about the consequences is how a lot of evil is achieved in the world. The tragedy of this play is that the deaths of Antigone, Haman and Eurydice could have been prevented. Thebes could have had a just and fair ruler. And while Creon bears the ultimate responsibility, he has been supported and helped throughout by this chorus of office workers as they stamp their files, collect their samples, and gather intelligence on unsuspecting members of the public. Every member of this group contributes towards the play's horrific end. The naturalistic approach to the chorus is more than just busy work or a way for each actor to feel connected to their character. The relatability of office work means that we as the audience question the moral dilemma of the play. What are we helping? What are we bearing witness to? Would we have done any different in their place? Exploring the ensemble. The question of how an ensemble is different to a chorus is always tricky to define. There is a lot of overlap in how different theatre practitioners use these terms. In this production, we see that the chorus are all men and have the choral lines divided up amongst them. However, the boundaries are blurred. Cobner Holbrook Smith is listed as messenger, not as chorus, even though he acts as part of the chorus of men throughout the production and also speaks some of the chorus's lines. Two female actors, Emily Glenister and Joe Dockery, are listed under ensemble. Similar to the members of the chorus, they have their individual job titles and sets of activities. In this production, there weren't any clear lines between cast, ensemble and chorus. This was probably the result of needing to have actors on standby in case some speaking characters fell ill during the run. Jo and Emily, for example, were understudies for the three other female roles of Ismene, Eurydice and Antigone. It's interesting to think about how these sorts of distinctions are worked out or maybe ignored in the rehearsal room. Does it matter if you're in the company, the chorus or the ensemble? Creating an effective ensemble requires the cast to have a bond with one another, and the archive materials show us that this was built up on research trips to places like the Churchill War Rooms and to the secret nuclear bunker at Kelvedon Hatch in Essex. In the rehearsal diaries, we also glimpse some of the exercises the whole cast took part in. There's a lovely detail here about Christopher Eccleston, who played the main role of Creon, taking part in these improvisation exercises, exploring the role of someone in charge of pest control in the bunker. This seems to be an important part of thinking about ensemble, breaking down the usual hierarchies of who's playing the main roles. The time spent on exercises and trips to build a sense of ensemble becomes visible in the smooth but meticulously choreographed way that the actors all move around each other in what Polly Finley describes as a kind of office ballet. Achieving this smoothness meant that the right kinds of props had to be available in rehearsals to assist with creating and practicing this choreography. We even find requests for chairs, drawers and other furniture units to be put on wheels to help with this. The mocked-up set in rehearsal allows the cast to hone the complex choreography of the piece, reminding us that a play is more than just its main characters. The ensemble activity in this production provides a significant counterbalance to the central conflict between Creon and Antigone. Search for yourself. A woman watches a film in the archive. The National Theatre Archive really is a unique resource that allows you to get up close to all these incredible productions and explore new interpretations of classic texts. If you want to come down and see any of this content for yourself, then feel free to contact us via our website. nationaltheatre.org.uk forward slash archive. The audio description was by Eleanor Margulies for Vocalise.